That's great. I, I love that. That analogy today about playing on the team. We've been looking at this journey together, and, and the, the theme has kind of been here that you are not finished yet. You are still in the making. You are still, no matter what age we are, you are still in the process. You know, in, in, the, in the UM church, the tribe that we're in, we talk about going on to perfection. You are still in this process of gathering, getting stronger in your faith. And we can make the choices that we want to make to do this, or we can make the choices not to. We can make the choices to become stagnant. We can make the choices to go in the wrong direction, or we can make the choices to go in the right direction. And so that's what we're kind of talking about in this whole series of journeying together. Today we're going to be looking at really three words. We're going to be looking at Christian, disciple, and temptation. As the title was, and these, these, the question is, are you a Christian or are you a disciple? And so there's all kinds of definitions for these words. So I'm not trying to label folks or, or anything, but we'll, we'll talk about it a little bit. And I think one of the ways that Jesus kind of showed us what it's like to be a disciple was the experience that he went through with temptation. Because that is a tremendous part of our lives as we're on this journey as we're on this journey together, as we're on the, your journey in your own life, are the temptations that come up. And they can be really minor temptations, but they can have major consequences. You know, you're tired of hearing about being donuts. But I love donuts. And for me, that's a temptation. If you were part of us when we, when we were doing the... Um, um, celebrate recovery. You know, I have a sugar addiction. My doctor this past time I went there said, yes, you do. It's a physical addiction I have to sugar, and it is ruining my life. And so I'm trying to do a whole lot. So that's a temptation. A lot of us have a whole lot of other temptations that are much more dramatic and drastic necessarily than a sugar ad addiction. And today we're going to look in the scripture at the temptations that Jesus went through. And, you know, I, I, I'm really thinking that for a great majority of Americans, these same temptations that Jesus went through, we do all the time. And if we can just look at them maybe in a little different way than we ever have before, maybe it can help us as we get through these same temptations. So, we're going to go to uh, Luke, it is, in chapter 4. We're going to start there. Last week, we had talked about Jesus being baptized, and he came up out of the water, and in the, God had just said, you are my son, and I love you, and you make me very happy. And so, this is pretty much what happens next in Jesus' life, starting with verse 1. Jesus returned from the Jordan River, from being baptized, full of the Holy Spirit, this is a key. I think this is a key to this whole thing. You've, if you've been in church, you pretty much know what's coming in this, in Jesus' temptations. We focus on a couple of issues in here, and we miss so many of the issues, and this is one of them. Full of the Holy Spirit, and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. There he was tempted for 40 days by the devil couple of things in here. These are the two points that probably get talked about the most in this whole piece of scripture is the 40 days. This is relationship to Moses being in the wilderness for 40 years before he saw the burning bush. The 40 number is significant as far as and then the, the Israelite people, the Hebrew people wandering through their own wilderness for 40 years. And so now here this 40 comes back again. Jesus is 40 days in the wilderness. And then the, the, the second part of this, series, this line is what everybody focuses on, I think, when they read this scripture. He was led by the devil. 
And I'm just amazed at how many people read the scripture and then from here on out they just say, well, the devil did this and the devil did that and the devil did that. And you miss the real point of this entire scripture. The point of the scripture is the temptation. The temptation that Jesus faced. So whether the devil did it, or, uh, that's when, when we say the word devil, there's in just the group of people here, you get all kinds of different views in your head. Some of you are probably thinking this red guy with a pitchfork and the horns. And then there's one interpretation and it goes all the way to the other interpretation of, of the devil is a, a phrase, a term that has been created to represent all the evil in the world, all the evil in human nature and the evil in mankind. If you can give it a title, that's the title. So I'm not trying to influence how you think in there. What I want you to focus on is the temptation here. That Jesus found these temptations. And how did he reply? And not so much what he said, but what did he do? So, we're going to go on. The scripture goes on. He ate nothing during these days. He was fasting. And afterwards, Jesus was starving. Fasting was a spiritual discipline, which we as United Methodists, that's not really one of our spiritual disciplines. And if you look at people like me, you would say it should be. I I'm, had a good friend, I think, well, a friend, who fasted for 40 days. And all he did was drink water. And he got Betsy and I stuck on this Propel water. I love Propel water. It has a lot of minerals and good vitamins and stuff in it. And he lost a lot of weight. And he really did show and know what it was like to go 40 days without eating. And he fasted. And it's probably a wonderful practice that we could get into. But we talk a lot about spiritual disciplines in our own lives, whether it's reading the scripture, whether it's prayer, however your spiritual discipline is. This was a spiritual discipline that Jesus had chosen to do at this time. He ate nothing during those days, and afterwards Jesus was starving. The devil said to him, Since you are God's son, command this stone to become a loaf of bread. Pretty simple request, really. You know, poof, it could be, it could happen. Basically, what the, what the devil was trying to say to Jesus was this. Who needs the character formation and self-control that comes from a spiritual discipline? Who needs that? You really don't need that. You're the son of God. That's a long, hard process, all this fasting, these spiritual disciplines. You have it all right now, public, public influence and private self-indulgence. You have this miraculous power. Why don't you just go ahead and use it? And this is the same temptations I think we, all of us, feel. All of us get into. We want it all right now. We think we can have it all right now. And we wish that we were like Jesus and we could turn the stone into bread because we'd turn the stones, every stone we could find, into every loaf of bread and we'd start selling bread. We'd have the biggest bread business in the world. But that's not what Jesus did. Jesus didn't use the power. He didn't seek the power. He didn't seek the fame and fortune that could come from having the biggest bread business in the world. Jesus replied in the scripture, it is written, people won't live only by bread. Bread's not all there is. We need more. More than what can be bought. More than what can be created by our work. We need love and God's love. Next, the devil led him to a high place and showed him in a single instant all the kingdoms of the world. The devil said, I will give you this whole domain in the glory of all these kingdoms. It's been entrusted to me, and I can give it to anyone I want. 
Therefore, if you will worship me, it will all be yours. Where do you put your allegiance? What do you worship? What is it that is most important to you? Is what this temptation is. And for so many of us, it is not God. It is, it can be a car. It can be another person. It can be where you live. It can be, we all have, I think we all have these things that, we need to strive and remember and be able to put God first, but we have the list that goes down. And what are they? And is God first on the list is the question. You know, when the devil was speaking to Jesus, he says, get on the fast track to power. I can give you all of this. The self-seeking power, not giving love, reigns supreme is what we do, we put in God first. Is what we do based in love or is what we do based in self for us? What we do, is it for us or is it for others? It just comes back to so often when the training that Betsy and I have had, we talked about church events and the way a whole church can run. Does a church run for yourself or does it run for others? Does it run to please the people here or does it run to make the world a better place? We've talked about that since the beginning of Journey. Are we doing for ourselves or are we doing for God? That's this real question. The third temptation. The devil brought him into Jerusalem. Poof, all of a sudden he's in Jerusalem and stood at the highest point of the temple. And he said to him, on this highest point of the temple, since you are God's son, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to protect you. And they will take you up in their hands so that you won't hit your foot as a stone. Basically, the devil was saying to him, prove yourself as God's child. Prove to yourself that God loves you so much that he would protect you. Prove to the world that God loves you so much that he would save you. And Jesus says, it has been said, don't test the Lord your God. You need to remember in this, Jesus had just left the Jordan River. He had just come up out of the water and the dove descended on him and that's when he heard from God, the Father, that he was loved. We talked about it last week, that he was loved and he was very pleased. We follow the same temptation. We're not, I don't know if we're trying to test God, but we sure do spend a lot of time thinking that nobody really loves us that we're not really important, and that there's nothing really special about ourselves. We're just common everyday folks, and there's not wrong with being common everyday folks, but when you take it to the point that nobody loves me, I don't have any reason to get up today, because God loves you. And we don't need to test God for that. We need to know that God loves us. It comes back to what we talked about last week, really, in that one. But these temptations are there. Verse 13 finishes up the story. After finishing every temptation, the devil departed from him until the next opportunity. I think that's interesting. It didn't mean, didn't say that the, even from Jesus, the devil didn't part from Jesus. These temptations didn't, that wasn't the only time he had the temptations. It was just the finish of that time. The temptations were again and again and again. And it's just like we face the temptations again and again and again. Jesus wasn't seeking the power he wasn't seeking the prestige. He wasn't seeking what most of us today are seem to be seeking in this world. We want power, prestige. We want people to recognize us when we walk in the door. We want just to be known in the community. 
We want to have more than enough money. We want these things. And through Jesus' temptations, he can show us that's not what he wanted. And what he wanted was love and to make a world that's full of love. And how we can do that is the question. Following this scripture, this is when Jesus really starts into his ministry. And it's not long after that that Jesus starts calling his disciples. And there's depends on which book in the Bible you read of how he called the disciples and where they were and what they did. And we talk about the disciples dropping their nets and some of them left their family fishing business. And they left and became his followers. What they did for a great part was leave behind this life that was full of these temptations for most of them, I think for all of the disciples, and were able to step away. And what they did is, is that at the time, and it somewhat is now, for if you follow a rabbi, you take on their life you completely separate yourself from what you were and what you were doing, and you follow them. The disciples did the same thing with Jesus. They entered into this rigorous program of transformation. They were learning a new way of life, a new set of values, and a new set of skills. It meant living the, leaving the comforts of home behind. Leaving this, you know, of I've told most of you, you've heard me talk about the Zebedee brothers. The two brothers were fishermen. Their father ran a big fishing business. When I was at Duke, um, Dr. Eifert, who, who taught all the New Testament, said that it was recorded that their father went bankrupt after they left. The fishing business went under without his sons there. They left a very lucrative business. It relied on them. But they were the next generation. They were the ones who were going to come. They kind of had it made. You read in the Bible, they're mending their nets and they cast them out. And this is where how they're called. They, they, what do they know? They know fishing. In the scripture in between, before Jesus called them here, Jesus sees them, they're out in the, in the boat, and he tells them to throw the nets over on this side, and they catch this huge load of fish. He speaks to them in a way in which they know, but he also feeds a little into their, their temptation. But then they see, if he can do that, what else can he do? And they begin to follow, and they leave those temptations behind. We've talked a lot about temptation. We haven't talked about Christian and disciple. In the Bible, the word disciple is listed about 250 times. The word Christian, I think, is listed twice. I really feel that we are as American and maybe as European, maybe as entire Christianity, we are very content with being Christians. As Betsy said, we are very content with putting on the suit and not taking the step, not walking back away from these temptations, not seeking this power, not... It's, just, it's been, to me, just so very interesting to observe through the years the number of people who come to church every week, and then by the end of the week, they, by the next day, much less the end of the week, they've gone back to the old life. They've gone back to, what can I do to make the most money? I really don't care if it hurts you if I make a dollar. What can I do that will probably hurt my relationship with my spouse? And it's not they're trying to find something, it's just they don't care. What can that change be? And so Jesus didn't call his followers 
to be Christians. Jesus called his followers to be disciples. And so as we look at this question today, my question is, is are we Christians or are we disciples? And so that's just how I kind of define those two terms. Which one are we? Are we Christians or are we disciples? Where do we fall in the temptations? How do the temptations affect and rule our lives? This is a question we got to make a decision about. As we said with this series, you can make a decision to go one way or the other. You can make a decision to accept that the temptations are just part of my life. This is part of what I, who I am. This is how I was created. And yes, I've got to suffer with these. Or you can just say, with my strength and faith in God, I don't have to suffer with these temptations. I don't have to suffer with this. And so I can let it go and let God be in control. It's a choice you get to make. Hopefully you'll know which one to do. Will you pray with me, please? Father, as we gather this day, as we think about these temptations, the temptations that Jesus faced, we can, I believe, form most of our own temptations back to one of these three of power and greed and need and more than just excessive need. And we can be called to become disciples. We can be called to be one of those who are following our rabbi, following our savior, following your son, Jesus Christ. And so we can make this decision on what it is and how it is that we choose to live, how we choose to allow our desires and needs to be met. It's a journey that we're on. And I know that some of us have suffered with some of these temptations for so very long. And now to just to be able to let some of them go and to place them back with you and to know that they are not temptations to us any longer, that with your love and our love within you, our trust in you, and that we don't need to strive and worry about having such greatness in this world. Because you will provide everything we need, you will give us all that's required, and you will allow us to be used by you and any greatness that we can achieve will be in your name, will be through your power, and will be for the benefit of the kingdom. So, Father, help us just to see these things. We ask for that guidance, and let the Holy Spirit come and lead us in each one of our lives just as the Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness and back out. Let the Spirit lead us and let us be smart enough to follow the leadings of that of the Holy Spirit in our lives. So Father, we ask that you hear our prayer today. Amen.